Good morning, church. If you're a two-year-old to fifth grader, you can head to Children's Church. And in your Bibles, you can turn with me to Mark chapter 9. That's where we will be today. Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. Uh, I want to actually draw your attention to a specific verse before I read the whole passage. And that is Mark 9, 24. Mark 9, 24, the father of this demon-possessed son says this. It says that immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And man, that is like the inner struggle of every disciple of Jesus. And even, you could even maybe go further to say non-believers. is this constant struggle of put, pitching our feet into both sides of both camps of belief and unbelief. And so throughout this passage, and what I want to talk to you about today, is this struggle that all of us endure on different levels, almost maybe on a daily basis, of I have belief, Lord, but help my unbelief. Let's get the context of why the Father got to that point on that day. It says in verse 14 and following of Mark 9, Mark writes, and when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, and scribes arguing with them, and immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, Jesus, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. Verse 18, and whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse so that most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. The thing that is the, mo the most, probably most insightful thing, one of the most insightful things I learned this week is that this story, as it appears, revolves around the boy and the father. But really, there are many people that are involved in this story that kind of take a back seat, but that are all part of this struggle of belief and unbelief, as I prefaced earlier. And that leads me to this observation that the scribes, the disciples, the father and his son were all suffering from some level of unbelief, that it says that whenever Jesus and Peter and James and John came down from the mountain, if you look at verses 1 through 13 in chapter 9, the passage right before this is when Peter uh, gives this privileged status to Peter, James, and John to go up on the Mount of Transfiguration, and they get a heavenly glimpse of Jesus, like in his full divinity, and it is awesome, and it is sweet, and they have to come down from the mountain, and so, I mean, you read that right there, right? When they came to the disciples, when they came down from the mountain in verse 14, the, the nine disciples that were left at the bottom of the hill in the sin-corrupted world, it's kind of like this get back to reality, right? Think about when you graduated high school or maybe even graduated college. It's like, woohoo, let's celebrate that. And then it's like, I have to get a job and work for the next 40 years, right? It's like, then reality sinks in like, okay, now work is going to start on a daily basis for the next like three or four decades of your life. Think about having the baby, right? Gender reveal parties and like getting excited about having a baby. And then the baby comes and you're like, 
wow, this is a lot of work to care for a child, right? And think about even buying a home. It's all celebratory. I'm a first-time house buyer, right? And you're like, we just signed it for a house. We just got a house. It's like, no, the bank's got the house. We got debt and a mortgage. That's what we got, right? And it's house maintenance. How many of you love house maintenance, right? It's like literally this whole year for me and Katie, like we keep thinking financially we're going to get ahead of the eight ball. And it's like boom, 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 boom. Like thing after thing with our house keeps having to get fixed. It's hard whenever we start at the mountaintop and have this mountaintop experience, if you will, and then to come down. And that's really like the walk of almost every believer of Jesus, right? It's like up, down, up, down. We've all had mountaintop experiences with Jesus. And then we come back in the valley in this encrypted world and are reminded like, wow, we are still here on earth. And that is not the greatest thing. It certainly does not compare to heaven. And so that's like the context here of what has just happened before this passage. And so from Peter and James and John's perspective... They're seeing both sides of what's going on here. They're seeing what's going on in heaven. They're seeing what's going on here in earth. And the scribes, it doesn't say, look at verse uh, 15, or uh, 16 rather. Jesus says, what are you guys arguing about with them? It says the scribes and the nine disciples that were left, they were arguing. doesn't say what they were arguing about, but more than likely what they were arguing about is kind of revealed in the passage, right? This father brought his demon-possessed son that is, like, convulsing him terribly. He's tried to kill him many times by throwing him in the fire and water, foaming at the mouth, all of this stuff, making him rigid. And the disciples were unable to do what with the evil spirit? They couldn't cast it out, right? They were unable to. And it's like, why were they unable to? We will get to that in a second. But what I want you to draw your attention to is the scribes are, like, over here, like, taking that as an opportunistic time to, like, beat down and browbeat the disciples, the nine disciples, for their inability to do something supernatural. It's like, oh, see, I guess Jesus isn't, you know, like, you can see where that conversation was going and the debate that they were having. But nonetheless, the nine disciples were digging their heels in and were, like, still going toe-to-toe scribes. But scribes, they were always going to suffer from belief because they have dug their heels in, but they concrete over their feet, right? They are never, similar to the Pharisees, it's like they have permanently decided their whole life, like, We will be hard-hearted to Jesus our entire life. And nothing we see, even though he heals us born in front of him, like you don't read about the scribes the rest of the passage. It's kind of like they just fade off into the darkness, right? Like, well, guess we were wrong again. But they continue to suffer from disbelief. But so do the disciples because they were unable to cast this spirit out. And look, whenever Jesus asks the question, who in verse 17 is the one that answers the question? It's the Father. It's the one individual, the scribes and the disciples, the crowd, like no one gives an answer to Jesus' question. It's just deafening silence. And then the father speaks up in verse 17 and reveals him. It's no wonder that this father was so desperate, right? We read in Luke's account of this same story that this man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son for he's my only child. So just like a lot of healings that we've already looked at in Mark, again, here we have another parent it's their one kid. And it's like, you, it says that from childhood, right? That's what he says at the end of verse 21 when Jesus says, hey, dad, how long has this been happening? You can imagine the kind of torment for the dad was feeling and the son, obviously, as well. And so what's interesting here is that Jesus, as he kind of gets the details of the situation, he says in verse 19, look at that. He says, oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him, the son, to me. It's like, who is that that directed at? Verse 19, right? When I read that through the first time on Monday, that was kind of confusing for me. Is is that a point of direct comment to the father? Is he talking to the disciples, the scribes? That's why I have this up here, this previous point, is that because I think he's talking to everybody, right? It's like they were all suffering from disbelief in different kind of ways, so he indicts everybody. This is kind of like the church in the 21st century, right? The American church in 21st century. We have all the power in the world. You know, the Holy Spirit says, the scripture says that he empowers us. That it says in Romans 8 that the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead dwells in believers of Christ. Did you know that? It's like that is some kind of supernatural power, correct? And it's like, but yet often we feel like we're powerless, right? Uh, because we all know this roller coaster of going from belief and unbelief, back and forth, back and forth. And what I want you to know in verse 24 is that the two can coexist together, right? You think either someone's got to be all unbelieving or someone's got to be all believing, right? 
that's kind of just the way we pragmatically think about it. But, but what we see with the, the father is that he's like, I believe, but also help my unbelief where I'm still lacking. And so we see how that takes place. If you will, just go back like maybe one or two pages in your Bible to Mark chapter 6. Look at this with me. I thought that this was interesting. It's really, it's really interesting given the context of Mark 6 that the nine disciples could not cast this demon out. Look what it says in Mark chapter 6, verses 7 and 13. It says Mark 6, 7, And he, Jesus, called the twelve, that is the twelve apostles, disciples, and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the what? The unclean spirits, what this boy is suffering from. Then look at verse 13, same chapter of 6. They, ca- they, the disciples, the 12 disciples, apostles, they cast out many what? Demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and what? And healed them. So it's like they've not only been given authority to do this by Jesus, they've also, Jesus' power has been manifested on him. Now think about this, the first time that the disciples are going about doing this healing ministry with Jesus' authority, do you think that they are totally reliant and dependent on Jesus to like go through with the authority he's given them and to do that? Or do you think they're just doing their special incantations and saying, don't worry Jesus, I got this under control, I'll figure it out. The first time, they were totally dependent on what Jesus is saying, right? Because they had never done anything like this. This was totally outside of their ballpark. But now, in this passage in Mark 9, it seems that Jesus and, Matt and Peter and James and John are up on the Mount of Transfiguration, Mount Hermon, and then these nine disciples are down here, and they're forgetting this dependency that they need. In other words, they are operating with faith in and of themselves. And now, the scribes are berating them for it, right? Because when, as disciples of Jesus, when we behave or are faithless, and the, the outside world, non-believers, they take note of that, right? And so when we're living in the way that they are in Mark 9, the nine disciples, it reflects not only bad on the nine disciples, but it reflects primarily bad on who? Jesus. That's right. And so this is why I think this story is in the Bible. It's drawing this out. Is It's this whole idea of, like, I believe in myself, right? You ever heard of, like, self-will or willpower, you know, just... I'm just going to muster up enough willpower and I'm going to overcome this sin or I'm going to muster up all my human resources and I'm going to figure out a solution to the problem. I think, uh, think about Samson for a second, right? This was like his biggest downfall is that he was supernaturally super privileged because there was only a handful of people in the Old Testament that got the Holy Spirit like for their whole life and Samson was one of those people and so he's operating the spirit is filling him but day by day slowly he gets to this camp of i can do it myself i can help myself and that's exactly what happens with delilah when she keeps trying to extract the secret of his strength finally he tells her and they cut off his hair it's extinguishing the nazarite vow right and he just wakes up and it says in judges 16 he says i'm gonna i'm gonna shake myself free i'm gonna break free of these ropes and it says that he couldn't because what left him It says the spirit of the Lord had left him, unbeknownst to him. So like he started, you know, he's doing all these supernatural feats of strength, thinking like, it's me, I'm the strong guy, I'm the one that can do it. I don't need God's help in my life, I don't need his power in my life, I don't need his grace in my life. And then he finally woke up one day, and he was totally subdued by the Philistines, his eyes were gouged out, and he got to ground mill at the prison one of the most haunting verses of the Bible, that's where not depending on Jesus gets you in life, right? It gets you enslaved to sin. It gets you nowhere in life, practically or physically speaking. And you're just so lost. I mean, Samson, I mean, like literally lost. He can't even see where he's going. He has to have people escort him to the pillars whenever he knocks down the temple to the Philistine God. And so when we say, I believe in myself, we have already lost the spiritual battle before it begins. We need to know that because there's a lot of people who promote self-help stuff and like think positively and just all this stuff and it's like no depend on Jesus that's the answer to all of life's problems and situations in life which leads me to this next observation about belief and that is that belief happens when we are totally dependent on Jesus that's where the father finally gets to that point that breaking point in verse 24 
He's like talking with Jesus about the situation, but he's so disheartened because he's already tried to go to Jesus, but Jesus was unavailable because he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. So he goes to the nine disciples that represent Jesus. They were unable to do it, so if you were the father, you would probably be disheartened too. You would probably be suffering from some level of disbelief as well. The disciples, it, they did not fail casting the demon out because of lack of effort, right? It's like they certainly tried to do everything within their own power to cast the demon out. But that was the problem, right? Is that they were trying to do everything within their own power and not within Jesus' power. They did their best. They believe in the process. But this is where Satan slithers in, I think, with all, not just disciples here in the story, but with all of us. One of Satan's two biggest deceptions, he tries to get everybody in the world to believe. And really, even with Adam and Eve, it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. He's, Satan is always trying to deceive us and get us to, number one, doubt God's power, and number two, doubt God's goodness. That was really the temptation rooted in that temptation in the garden, right? Like, is God really good? Is he really all-powerful? Like, do we really have to be subordinates to God? Do we really have to serve God? Is he really good? Does he really want what's best for you? These are all the things that were rooted in the question from the snake in the Garden of Eden, and so this father, he's tapped out. You can imagine, if this has been going on, quote, from childhood, he has surely exhausted every human resource, and now Jesus is in his area. He's gone to his disciples, and he's just, like, crushed. Think about the son again for a second. It says that he was demon-possessed in verse 18. In Luke 9, 39, it says that he was screaming. And then in our passage, again, in Mark 9, it says that the son was thrown to the ground, that he foams at the mouth regularly, that he grinds his teeth, that he becomes as stiff as a boar, that he gets cast into fire and water. He is mute and deaf. Just picture that. For, just close your eyes and picture that for a second. I mean, you can imagine this guy's reality as he watches his maimed, burnt son wallowing in the dirt with terror-filled eyes, unable to talk or hear, and convulsing violently on a regular basis. That's how the father hurt, but what we sometimes lose sight of is that Jesus felt something in this situation. Well, as much as the father was hurting, Jesus felt this struggle too. And that's what I want to get at here is the father, he finally just gets to this breaking point of, he says, look at verse uh, 22 again at the end of it. He says, but if you, talking to Jesus at the end of verse 22, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus says, if you can, to quote him, you know, it's, it's like, that's kind of like our prayer life sometimes, isn't it? It's like we try to exhaust every human resource. We try to like muster up enough willpower or self-help strategy or whatever the thing is that we're doing, whatever it is that's not being dependent on Jesus. And then we finally go to Jesus and we're like, man, I should probably like tap Jesus in this situation. And that's kind of how we pray like, man, Lord, Help me if you can. And, it, and Jesus just reminds us today, like, if you can, if you can, have you forgotten all the supernatural things that my track record testifies to? The father's faith was shaken. But that's where verse 24 is so pivotal in this passage, I think. Because when he says, I believe, but help my unbelief, he's saying, I believe, Jesus, but help me in spite of me. How many of you have had to say that to God? I know I've had to, Right? Like, Lord, help me. I know me is my biggest stumbling block in my life right now, right? That's what the father said. I mean, he's just totally vulnerable and transparent. He says, Lord, there is a part of me that believes, but there is a part of me that is struggling to believe because this has been my reality for so long. So please, Lord, in your grace, help me to believe if you can. And so that's what Jesus says. What is he, look what he says in verse 23. All things are possible for the one who what? Believes. Yeah, just underline that word, circle it. The one who believes. This is what Jesus is saying here is like divine ability is not the problem in this situation. It's not a matter of can Jesus heal your son and cast out the demon. The problem is human unbelief, not divine ability. Look what Hebrews 1 and 6 say. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for the conviction of things not seen. Just think about that for a second. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That's what believing looks like. 
It's like without tangible evidence, without something to look at or touch or smell or taste or whatever, it's like we hope for that, we believe in that. He goes on to say, the writer of Hebrews, and without faith, without believing, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. I think that's what Jesus is getting at here when he quotes the Father and is like wordsmithing his statement in verse 22. And he's saying, if you can, anything is possible for the one who believes. They will be rewarded. That's what the author of Hebrews confirms for us as well. Have you noticed that during failing moments in our life, during times of unbelief, that's when like our dependency on Jesus seems to take a step actually forward and progress because why? Because like God is over here watching us just tap everything within our resources, including ourselves, and he's just like standing over here waiting for us to be totally dependent on Jesus. And it's like when we finally realize that, when we finally realize that we can't be independent as much as we try to in life, right? Anyone tried to be like independent in life and be like, I'm self-made, I don't need help from anybody, that just doesn't work for anybody. That's like no one's life experience can testify to that. And so in our craving for independency, we really find out at the end of the day that we really need to be totally dependent on Jesus. That failure deepens our dependence on him. I'll, just a sidebar, and I'll move on from this, but verse 23, when Jesus says, all things are possible for the one who believes You've probably heard some preachers, televangelists, maybe other Christian friends, whatever, like quote Mark 9, 23, and like do this name it and claim it movement, you know, like, man, if you really want that Mercedes Benz, like just make sure to have enough faith, make sure you believe enough, make sure you grunt hard enough, and it will be rewarded to you. Have you heard that before? That's why I think about that movement. What is the context here of verse 23? When Jesus says, look at the statement again. He says in verse 23, all things are possible for the one who believes. Who's he talking about? Believes in who? Himself, Jesus, right? It's like he's getting the Father to like forget all the human possibilities and scenarios and resources and to focus and target his affections and desire and faith in one person namely Jesus. And so it's not like believe in Jesus hard enough and you can get any and you can like make any materialistic dream in your life come true. That's not the context here. Jesus is saying, I want you to be totally dependent. I want you to forget Satan's deception that God is not all powerful, that God is not all good, but that God is all powerful. He is all good and when you have total faith on me, anything is possible for the one who believes. That's the context in this passage here. Because we never advance beyond our need for Jesus. Hear that again. There's not one point in our walk with Jesus that we ever get ahead of Jesus and say, I'm good by myself now, Jesus. We never get past the point of needing to totally be dependent on him on a daily basis. The Father's weaknesses were exemplified in our passage, but Jesus' strength shined through his weakness. The Father's impotence is highlighted in our passage, but Jesus' omnipotence is highlighted. The Father's limitations is highlighted in the passage, but Jesus' unlimited resources are highlighted. The Father's humility is highlighted in this passage, and Jesus' sufficiency is the answer to this guy's problem. This leads me to this last observation today, and that is this, about belief. I, want you, I really hope you remember this today. For the rest of your life, that belief is a constant action and not a one-time decision. I think so tragically, sometimes we just, however we've been taught, whatever our spiritual background is, even if we have no spiritual background, we're just under this impression sometimes that like, let me raise my hand, let me confess Jesus one time, let me get baptized, and let me like have this one day where I like put all my belief on Jesus, and I'm totally dependent on Jesus that day, and then I'll just, I'll talk to people like that, right? It's like they'll tell me something that happened at camp or their home church or when they went to church with grandma 50 years ago. And it's, I'll ask them, you know, like what's been going on in the last 30, 40 years of your life, like as far as advancing the kingdom of God, walking with Jesus. And they're like, oh, I went to church with my grandma like 40 Easter's ago. And I'm like, right, you're not hearing what I'm saying, right? 
because it's this, I, this is true, right? Because if it wasn't true, like, it would be like, well, what's going on here? And so belief is like taking today, November 3rd, 2019, saying, I believe in Jesus. I believe it is vital and imperative to be totally dependent on him and to cast all my faith, even though I can't see Jesus, like Hebrews 1 or 11, 1 says, I'm going to put all my marbles into Jesus' bag. And then we're going to wake up tomorrow, November 4th, 2019, and we're going to have to make another decision. Do I believe in Jesus today or not? And then November 5th, and so on and so forth. See, the reason I highlight this is look at what it says in verse 28 as we kind of get to the end of the passage here. It says when Jesus and his disciples kind of got off privately, it says when they had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? Circle the word we. Take note of the word we. That is the answer to their question is because it was themselves that they were focusing on, as I've already prefaced it, that they were thinking that they could be self-sufficient. I think sometimes we think faith is like money in the bank. Let me explain what I mean by that. I think we think like, oh, I went to X years of camp. Oh, I went to X years of church as a kid with my grandparents. Oh, I did, you know, I've done these Easter services. Oh, I helped this person out with money this one time. Oh, I've done this. And we think like that all of these things like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, they just get all stored up to our name. And then we like tie the bag, put a bow on it, give it to the Lord. We're proud of that. We should be. But at the same time, we think, okay, I've done that. I've done a good deed for the year, for the week, the month, whatever. And we cast it aside and think, okay, that's my faith over here. I'm going to walk over here, right? And we, like, disassociate ourselves from the faith that we did, the works that came out of the grace that we've been saved by from that. And we walk away over here, and we're all the way over in Timbuktu, and we still think that we're a believing Christian. And Jesus is saying, All things are possible for the one who believes. That's why that father gets to the point because I think he's been in this have your cake and eat it too mentality, right? Like I believe, but Jesus, I realize what you're saying. I need you to help my unbelief. There has to be like this daily renewal. His faith isn't perfect, but it is real faith. We need to take note of that with the father. I want you to think about God's resources like this. Like, think about the drums and the drum shield. This is, think of this as like a reservoir of sorts, okay? This is God's reservoir of unlimited resources. Do we believe that God can do anything? What would you say to that question, church? Okay, so if we say yes to that, this is like everything and anything that God can do is right here in this drum shield. And we, but we're over here, and we have to think. <clears throat> this is by Chuck Swindoll, by the way, this analogy. We're over here, and so God's reservoir of unlimited resources is over there. It's heaven and earth, right? So how do we get God's unlimited resources into our life? Well, there's got to be a pipeline that goes from the reservoir over to here, right? And that pipeline is what we would call faith or belief. But then it's still in the pipeline, right? It's still got to be brought out. And so what does Jesus say in verse 29? He says, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. And so we put the faucet on the end of this pipe that's coming from God's reservoir. You know what the faucet is? Yeah, that's right. What does it say in verse 29? Prayer. And so it's like, wow, we believe this, but here's the pipeline. We got to believe. We got to, like, get the pipeline right. And then the faucet is prayer saying, God, I believe this. i continuing to believe this. I believe this now. Lord, I pray in your grace that this would happen. I want you to think of this, this statement here, that, that it's a daily decision for us to be dependent and believe in Jesus. There's three verses I want to show you that like I think really support this belief. In Exodus 16:4, <clears throat> it says, "Then the Lord said to Moses, they're out in the wilderness, they're going to have to wander around for 40 years. There's going to be a lot of people die off in the wilderness." It says, "Then the Lord said to Moses, behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not." How many days did they have to go out and collect manna? Every day. Like, I know for some of you, you're thinking, not the Sabbath day, they had to collect two days. You're right, but go with the analogy, right? It's like every day. And what is the Lord saying? That I may test them to see if they're going to bank on me today or not. They might be banking on me today. They've seen the manna fall down, rain down from heaven today. But I want them to wake up tomorrow and say, I'm banking that the Lord will sustain me today. 
I'm thinking that he's going to rain food from heaven on Wednesday, on Thursday, and so forth. And so look at this. It says in Proverbs 23, 17, let not your heart envy sinners. Those would be unbelievers, by the way. But continue in the fear of the Lord. How long? All the day. Every day. If I could paraphrase for you, 24-7. Not just for one hour a week. Not just on this day. Not just on Wednesdays. Not just on Sundays. But every day, King Solomon says, don't envy unbelievers because the reality and their long-term future, I promise you, is nothing to invest in, right? Rather, all the day, every day, 24-7, walk in the fear of the Lord. Walk in believing in me. And finally, what Jesus says, I'll take Jesus' words out of his own mouth in Luke 9:23, And he said to all, if anyone would come after me in belief, <coughs> let him deny himself and take up his cross how often? Daily and follow me. So I just can't stress this enough that belief, as maybe some of you came in today thinking like, I believed, you know, 10 days ago. I believed 10 years ago. I believed 10 hours ago. Belief is this constant, progressive, habitual action that we decide. We either take a step in the camp of belief each day or we take a stamp, a step in the camp of Unbelief, it just hammers us out throughout the Bible constantly. Verse 29, Jesus says, quote, this kind. And it's easy to read that and think, well, this demon that was in this boy was like, unlike a lot of descriptions that we read in the Gospels of demon possession, it was like making him foam at the mouth, making him become rigid, throwing him, to fi- throwing him into fire, into water. Like, maybe this was like a super powerful demon, unlike other demons, like even more powerful than the regular demons. But what Jesus says by this kind is not because like this demon that was in this boy is like super powerful or super just has, can do things that other demons can't. Rather, he generally says this kind referring to demonic activity, referring to Satan's kingdom. This kind of activity with Satan's kingdom, namely demon possession in our passage, cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. And you're like, well, Jesus didn't pray in the passage, so how did he cast out the demon that can only be driven out by prayer, right? You might be thinking that. I was thinking that. What does prayer force us to do? Like, whether we're literally on our knees or not, when we pray, it's literally this not only symbolic but literal transaction that's happening of us saying, God, I'm dependent on you for things that I cannot do, right? When we pray, that's literally what we're, whether we're praising God or offering you know, a request or whatever it may be, it's like that's what's happening there is we're, we're in a humbled state putting faith in God and saying, God, I pray that you would do supernatural things that I naturally cannot do. That is, I think, why Jesus says in verse 29, this kind, in other words, just Satan's activity in the world is only driven out by prayer when we say, I believe in God's reservoir I have faith that creates this pipeline. I'm going to pray that this would happen for God's glory and God's will and for my goodness. I want to throw this your way. It's a pretty easy verse to remember. It's three words. Pray without what? 1 Thessalonians 5.17. This was the verse right before Brother Rozier's verse that he stated. In all circumstances, give praise, right? Give thanks. And so right before that, Paul, writing to the Thessalonican church, says, pray without ceasing. I used to, like, read that verse, like, so literal, right? It's like, man, we're all sitting right now because I guarantee everyone in the room is not praying right now, right? So you ceased, you stopped, you're sinning, right? Like, we sometimes think like that legalistically. But praying is not always just, dear God, A, B, C, D, in Jesus' name, amen, Praying is this idea of depending on God, right? It's this idea of casting belief in God again and again. And every time we pray, that's what we're doing, right? We're casting belief on God, that God is more powerful than us, that his resources are limited, that he's good, and that he's working all things for his good. I want to show you this acronym, again, from Chuck Swindoll. I created the acronym, but he created the questions, and I'm trying to make it easier easier for us to remember But I think we've all been in situations like the father with the demon-possessed boy. And you might be thinking, I don't have a son that's demon-possessed rolling around in fire. 
the reality is we've all been in situations that are uncontrollable. Do you agree with that or disagree? Everyone gets curveballs thrown at them in life on all different kinds of levels. And so it's like when that happens, that's when our faith, our belief in Jesus gets shaken to the core. It's like, well, I'm not in control anymore, so I don't know what to do. I don't know how to fix the problem. And so I just want to highlight these four things that if you're currently in an uncontrollable situation of how to work through that spiritually speaking. The G is called gaps is what I'm calling it. The G stands for God is all powerful and can do anything. That's the first step is do you believe in God's reservoir or not? Do you believe that he can do anything? And then the letter A is anything, right? It's anything might not be my thing. How many of you have prayed for something specifically in a very specific, unique way, and then it has not played out exactly as you prayed it? I'll raise like both my hands and my legs, right? Like I don't know how many times you can vote for that as your reality. It's like that happens all the time to us. It is so infuriating and frustrating, right? But we have to remember, if God can do anything, then he has things we can't do that could be a different solution to the problem that we didn't even know was a solution to the problem. That was confusing, but I hope you followed that, right? It's like he can do anything. And so just because he's not doing my specific word-for-word requests does not mean that God has stopped operating or caring for me, right? He's going to do his will in his way. And that's what P stands for. Pray that God would work out his agenda, Not our will, not our agenda, right? Can you imagine if God gave us every request and wish and prayer that we've ever offered up to him or thought about in our life? You think you'd be in the spot you were today? I promise you no, right? It's like, that's what we tell our kids, right? Parents, that's why you tell your kids no a lot, right? Because they're making requests and wishes and all this stuff all the time. It's like, nope, that's not good for you long term, right? Nope, that's not even good for you in the short term. And then S is finally getting to this point of surrendering our pride and getting to this place of the Father in Mark 9 and saying, I trust you, Lord. I trust that you're good. I trust that you're all-powerful, that you're omniscient, that you know everything, and that you're omnipresent. You can be everywhere at the same time. I believe that. That's what happened with Job. If you know the story of Job, it's like, He works through, and so when finally God shows up, Job's been questioning God, like, I want a day in court. I want to prove my innocence, and God finally shows up, and he's showing him things like a mountain goat giving birth, and he shows Job this eagle, and then he shows Job these ostriches that are neglecting their young, and then he shows Job behemoth and Leviathan, and it's like, what is the point of this trip to the zoo creation? And it gets Job's limited perspective and it shows us God's perspective of how God literally sees everything and is con- in control of everything in our world, but we just see our tiny perspective. And so after the zoo trip is over, this is what Job says in Job 42 too. Isn't this ironic? He says, I know that you can do all things. I believe in God's reservoir of unlimited resources. Job says, I believe that and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. That's the spot that God wants us to get to. Job was so broken. He had so many uncontrollable things happen to him. He was totally devastated. He lost 10 sons, all of livestock, all his servants, hold a few, all of his financial resources, everything he had worked so hard to build up in his own life was surrendered. And it would be easy to look at that and say, man, God is not good. God is not in control. God is not powerful. And he finally gets to this point where he realizes that God's perspective is different than his perspective. He says, I surrender to that. I realize that you can do all things, God, and I believe that your purpose will never be thwarted even by Satan's kingdom itself. Isn't that good news for us today? I'll close with this. I just want to read Romans chapter 4 as we close. Romans 4, 19 through 25, Paul talking about Abraham and Sarah says this. He, Abraham, did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. (laughs) Isn't that about what every 100-year-old would testify to? He says, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. Remember, Sarah's only like a decade younger than him, so she's like 90. Hey, I'm expecting. Let's do a gender reveal party, right? No, it says no. Unbelief, it says no. Unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God because what 190-year-old says, oh, yeah, we're about to have a baby, even though we've been trying for decades. No belief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his what? He grew strong in his faith, and as he gave glory to God, he was, look at this phrase, fully convinced. 
that God was able to do what he had promised. This is what it always comes down to, church, is belief that God is good, he's all-powerful, he's omnipresent, he's omniscient, he knows everything, he's everywhere at the same time. It goes on to say, that is why his, what? His faith was counted to him as righteousness, but the words, quote, it was counted to him as right, or it was counted to him, end quote, were not written for his sake alone, but also for ours. It will be counted to us, all of us in the world today, in 2019, it will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised up for our justification. Everything in life all depends on where we are in what camp. And like we often find ourselves with the Father in verse 24, man, I believe but I'm also somewhat unbelieving today. And so we always need to go to Jesus, cast our cares upon him, cast all our uncontrollable situations on him. And like Job say, going back to that, I know that you can do all things. Matter of fact, if you, if you believe Job 42 too, to be true, to be spirit-filled and inspired by God, and you believe that about God, will you just read that with me? Let's read Job 42 too. If you believe it, declare it today. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Man, I hope we put all the marbles in that bag, that God's reservoir is unlimited, that he's all powerful, that his perspective is contrary to ours. Ours is so minute and his is infinite. And that's gotta be good news for somebody today. I hope that you put your faith and belief in Jesus, as Paul says in Romans four, that you are, quote, fully convinced that God is able to do what he has promised, giving us salvation through his son Jesus, if you will pray with me. Dear Lord, this is a hard passage for us to swallow because like myself included, first and foremost, like everyone always is in this roller coaster spiritual journey of, man, we believe really good some days and some days we are really shaken and we don't believe. So Lord, I pray that we take a lesson from the father with the demon possessed son today And we just cry out to Jesus, Lord, I'm in that boat. I believe, but you know that I still have some unbelief in my heart, that I'm always often acting in unbelief and not belief. Lord, I just pray that we can continue to echo that statement from Job, that you can do anything, Lord, and that your purpose and your plans will never be thwarted. I hope that we bank on that every day, just like banking that the manna was gonna rain down from heaven, Just like the wisest man in the world next to Jesus says, keep walking in the fear of the Lord daily. Just like Jesus yourself said, pick up your cross daily and follow me. I pray that our belief is not a one-time decision today or previously in our life, but it is a daily action. It's a step of faith and belief that we take every day. If there's someone in the room that hasn't taken that first step of belief and faith in Jesus, Lord, would you send them to me this morning so that they can work through how they can believe in Jesus and be saved from eternal damnation and get to live in your goodness and in your presence forever. God, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.